I, uh, um, occasionally, as a pastor, sometimes when you share stories about things that are happening or, or um, examples of stuff, sometimes you have the opportunity where, um, or the blessing really, of somebody sharing a, a story of their own that, that kind of captures um, something that we've been talking about. And a couple weeks ago, we were looking at the idea of where do we experience or what is the impact of grace? So if we've been people who have experienced grace in our lives, God's generous gift to us of grace, like what should rightfully be the impact of that? And a friend of mine um, shared a story. It's really, um, it's her and her husband's story. And she heard her husband on the phone talking to um, someone and he just was sort of reflecting and saying, oh, thank you. It was great to meet you. I'm so glad you made it back and thanks for giving me a call. And so she asked, well, what was that all about? And, and the husband, who's also a friend of mine, began to relay this story about how he, had, he travels a lot for business and how in the course of, of this recent business trip, he sort of came across somebody who just was completely disoriented at O'Hare, which that can happen to any of us. But if you're unfamiliar with it and it's a busy morning, it can be an overwhelming experience. And you could just sort of tell this man was kind of lost there and people were buzzing by and going every which direction and he just sort of was stuck. So he went up to him and, and began to ask a few questions, and through the course of the conversation, the man was able to relay that he was trying to get his way back to Nigeria. He had been here visiting some family and was on his way back, but was confused about where he needed to be and where he was trying to go. And, and so um, my friend started to help him say, okay, well, here's how you get to the international terminal, and, 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 and eventually looks at his ticket and realizes that, that he's on the same flight. Um, they're actually both flying to London, and then this man is going to get on a, a connecting flight there and go to Nigeria. And so he's able to say to him, well, I'll, I'll take you through. And because my friend travels so much, because this is something he does so often for business, he's uh, got all the flight status benefits, you know, that come like platinum this and all that sort of thing. And so I don't know if you know this world exists out there, but this is nice, Okay. Um, and, and you go to the security line and there's like a special set of doors that people with this kind of status go through and you, you walk through there and, and along the way he takes the man with him who does not have that status and says, hey, he's with me. So he's able to go through this kind of uh, um, expedient sort of security system and they get into separate lines and go through the security and, and my friend is there waiting for him as he comes out and the man's kind of almost shocked and and, and so he says, come on, come with me. And they go sit down, and, and they actually go to a, a, a shoe shine place. He's got a little time to kill, right? And the guy's kind of a little overwhelmed, and he's like, no, no, no. And he says, yeah, sit down. You're with me. You're with me. And he sits down, and he has his, gets his shoe shine, and, and my friend pays for everything. And they still have some time to kill, so they go back to the, um, the Admiral's Club, uh, which I've recently discovered this place because I was traveling with a friend, and this is awesome. You know, there's just food back there and all these things. And they get in there, and again, you can't, you, you know, you can't just go back there. You have to have access. And they get there, and the Admiral's Club is just packed. And so they move to something that I did not know exists called the First Class Lounge, okay? This is where the people go when the Admiral's Club is a little, like, uh, overwhelming for them. And all along, he's taking this man with him into the first class lounge. He's with me. And there's this food spread everywhere, and he's kind of uncomfortable. He's saying, take whatever you want. And when they ask about paying, he, he says, no, no, he's with me. And they eventually, because my friend travels so often, um, gets to the gate. And there is a concierge that waits for him at the gate, welcomes him there, and says, hey, would you like to, to be seated? My friend sits down before anybody else. I don't know what status level this is, but it's good, okay? <laughs> and you get there, and you, you, he says you sit down, and, and again, he grabs the friend and invites him to go sit down before anybody else is on the plane, and he tells the person checking them in that, that he's with him. And the man from Nigeria at this moment just becomes so overwhelmed with gratitude that there, kind of at the gate of the airplane, he just starts to say, literally, I love you, I love you, I love you, you know? I would have said the same thing. <laughs> but as my friend is relaying this story to his wife, she, she's just reflecting on everything she's hearing, and she's like, this is exactly what Jesus has done for me. This is exactly what he has accomplished for me. He has used his access to pave the way for me to enter in, and we 
in retrospect, when we understand that, when we receive that, all we can do in that moment is be like, I love you, I love you, I love you. And Paul here in this book, in this letter to the Ephesians, he has been reminding us, he's been, he's been sharing the story of the gospel with the church in order to help us remember and to understand that it's a right response for us to say, I love you, I love you, I love you. In fact, this passage that we're going to look at this morning, I think, is one of the most descriptive in all the New Testament of, of who we are to be in the church and how we are to act in light of the reality of the gospel in our lives. Um, the focus of, of Paul's letter up to this point in Ephesians has been on, on understanding, retelling the gospel story, but now it's beginning to shift. He's moving from retelling them the story of their salvation, reminding them of who they were prior to Christ, reminding them that in Christ that they've been chosen and they've been redeemed, they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's reminded them of God's incredible love, his infinite love for them. He's reminded them of the amazing gift of grace. And now in light of all of that, Paul is going to begin to talk about the results or the consequences of his grace in this second half of the letter. In fact, I think we'll discover that Paul understands or views obedience to God, our, our, our willful act of following after God to be a result or a response to his grace towards us. Which this is, this is an important reminder for me. Because if you're anything like me, my, my desire is to run to the practical. Right? Just, just tell me what I need to do. Just, just help me get there. But Paul seems to understand that, that if we lack the, the foundation of God's grace, if we don't understand sort of the, the theology behind it, then we will lack the power and the motivation to be able to, to live out our faith. To live it out in a way that... that reflects exactly who he is and what he's done for us. I think this is why it's important when you and I spend time in our personal devotional life or in, in gatherings of small groups or in a corporate setting like this where we're opening up God's word. This is why the time that we spend doing that, thinking about things like doctrine and theology are actually critical to, to you and I if we are going to be committed to following the the way of Jesus. And for this reason now, Paul is, is diving into what it looks like. Before he dives into what it looks like for you and I to love each other, he took the time to remind us of how much we've been loved by God. He started by reminding us of the nature of God's love. See, the, the latter informs the, the former. So we begin to look at the second half of Paul's letter. We have to keep everything in mind that we've been focusing on over the last six weeks. We have to keep the first half in mind because it's going to inform what it is that Paul now wants us to understand as we begin to think about, okay, how do we put this into action? What does this look like? And this leads us to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at the first half of this together, you can turn there in your Bibles uh, with you, or it'll be on the screen as well. This is what Paul writes to the church. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean that he, but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every, kind, uh, every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Before we really dive into this just absolutely loaded section of, of this letter that Paul is writing. I'm going to give a bit of a disclaimer here because there's no way for us in the confines of, of the time that we have this morning to unpack everything that Paul has just talked about in these verses. And there's so much there that's both incredibly theologically profound and also immensely practical in the way that we live out our lives. So I'm going to I'm going to focus on a couple of the things that I see that I think are really vital in this overall direction that Paul is taking us, specifically looking at uh, what he means to live worthy, to maintain unity, and to pursue maturity. Let's look at at this first instruction, to live worthy. Paul begins this letter by going straight at it here. He says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So Paul is giving us a command here. This is only the second time in this entire letter that Paul has used the imperative tense. The the first time was in chapter 2 when he instructed us to remember. Remember that you were once Gentiles, that you were once outsiders. Don't, Don't forget that. And now he comes back to it. He is giving us this, this command, this, this mandate. And it's connected to everything that he has just told us about the nature of the gospel with this simple word, therefore. So essentially, Paul is writing to the church and he's saying, if God's love is so great, if, if his grace is so generous, if his salvation is so transformative, then we are called to live it out. You and I, our lives are meant to to be lived in such a way that it reflects the fact that these things are true. He's saying, okay, church, you you have a responsibility. I was thinking about this in terms of um, understanding what it means to to live in light of someone's legacy. You guys know I often talk about my dad, and I, I, uh, my dad was a huge influence on my life, and I hope it doesn't ever, I don't mean it to be like this, like, depressing thing. Um, it's not for me anymore. I, I, I look back on my relationship with my dad, and I miss him all the time, is, is sure. But I also look, and I can say, I had it incredibly, I, I was incredibly blessed to have the dad that I had. He was a huge influence on my life. He, he was a kind of guy that wasn't afraid to communicate that, that he loved me, he was there for me, he would be involved in my life, he coached my teens, he, um, he made sure that, that I was taught what, what the gospel was and had opportunities to grow in my faith and he was not a perfect human being but 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 I'm really really grateful on that human scale of dads I had it really good really really good and I remember sort of after his passing processing that reality and and it was kind of um, part of I think the mourning process for me where I started to get to the fact that life is is continuing and I, I will continue to go on and what does it look like to live in light of that legacy and there was part of me that thought you know it's going to be wrong it would be wrong for me to live as if I had not been given a tremendous gift like if my if my life didn't reflect the fact that I had someone model to me this incredible example that would be that would be an absolute shame and I think Paul is saying something very similar to us here as the church when we understand grace and we understand what he's talking about when he says walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He's saying, look, church, it would be wrong of you to live as if you haven't been given a tremendous gift. And we get this instruction here. He gives us these hallmarks of of what this looks like. He begins by talking about humility, this clear mark of the gospel in our lives. Paul says we should live with all humility because we of all people 
have come to understand that we were completely incapable in and of ourselves to save ourselves. So on the opposite end of that spectrum, spiritual pride then is always an indication that we have either misunderstood or somehow neglected, forgotten the gospel in our lives. When, I, when, I, when spiritual pride is present in my life, it's an indication that I have somehow misapplied the gospel in my own heart and life. So Paul says there's, there's a humility here. And then he talks about gentleness, which I'm not going to elaborate a great deal about this, but, but I think it is important to note that gentleness is not the same thing as timidity. One author described gentleness as strength under God's control. And as I was re- just sort of processing this, it was one of the things, this is one of the things about Jesus that I think is so extraordinary when you read through the Gospels is how the people in that society who were most vulnerable, the, the, the oppressed and the weak in that culture, how they felt safe and invited in to be around Jesus. Even in moments when the whole sort of event resulted in them being kind of exposed or their, their sin being made public, and, and yet around Jesus, they felt safe. There was, there was safety with him. But at the other side of that, Jesus was not afraid or incapable. He had the strength and the courage, the boldness to be able to confront things that needed to be confronted. Particularly corruption or corruption within the religious church, within the, the people that God had put there in order to draw others to him. Jesus didn't have a problem calling them out. He is an example of strength under God's control. And Paul says that, that this is a hallmark of you and I walking in a manner worthy of our calling. This, this particular trait, to me, stands out as I think about this. As something in our own culture that is a bit of a lost art. But the church is called to lead the way. We're, we're meant to reflect this, of what it means to be gentle. He goes on, talking about being patient, bearing with one another in love. Jo- uh, Paul is just going to make the transition now to start talking about this theme of unity, which is really central in this section of of his letter. But he says it's patience and it's love that paves the way for this. The early church father, John Christosom, describes patience this way. He describes it as a wide and big soul. Uh, Another commentator said that patience is the exercise of the largeness of soul that can endure annoyances and difficulties over a period of time. So Paul Paul is saying patience and love are intrinsically linked. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, he'll he'll simply say love is patient. So part of me just loves how honest Paul is here. Paul is not describing an environment where you and I are going to agree on everything, where we're going to get along perfectly all the time, and, and everything is always going to be easy. He doesn't suppose that in the church. And in fact, he doesn't suppose an environment where we're always going to like each other perfectly. He doesn't think that we're all going collectively on vacation together this summer. Okay? He knows that there's differences. He knows that there's a different approach. As a matter of fact, he's going to celebrate that in just a few verses. He's going to talk about the differences. But what he is saying is that even in the midst of the differences and the disagreements and the things that, that we would look at from different perspectives, there is a instruction, an assumption that he expects, an expectation of the church is that we would interact with those things because of the impact of the gospel with patience and with loving each other. That that's what it looks like to live out our calling, even in the midst of our, our, our disagreements. Humility and gentleness and, and patience and, and bearing with one another in love, these are all relational qualities. They are the relational qualities that are produced in us because we have been transformed by the gospel. And they are the means, they are essential to us accomplishing what Paul is just talking about in verse 3, where he says that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So let's take a moment to to unpack what Paul is talking about in this instruction to maintain unity. Maintain unity. And I think this is really Paul's driving force, his driving point in this portion of the letter. And in the midst of all the ethnic and cultural and social economic and 
and any number of other differences, racial differences that existed in the church at Ephesus in that time. He's saying because of Jesus, because of the power of the gospel, we can be, we are called to be unified. Let's look again back in chapter 4. This is verse 3 through 6. He talks about bearing with one another in love. And he says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I've tried to think about how to describe unity, and, and, and we talk a lot about this in our culture, right? There, in fact, I would say right now there's this heightened sense or this heightened desire for experiences of unity, and yet... And even in the midst of that, there's this ever-growing sense that, that we are disunified. In fact, all the fragmentation that can happen in our culture and the world around us can easily leak into an environment like this together, right? Can easily leak into a situation where we become at odds with each other. And so Paul is going to address that here. And I was thinking about how do you picture, how do you capture the idea of unity? And I remember my parents taking, when my older brother was kind of doing the college visit thing, taking us down to their alma mater in Longview, Texas, Laterno University. That's where my parents met. At the time, there was a 30 to 1 guy-girl ratio. So the fact that my dad met my mom at Laterno, it's like a, a minor miracle that I'm here at all, really. And they were taking my brother down there, and I said, Dad, if you want, you want Scott to go to this college, you might not want to lead with the 30 to 1 ratio statistic to him, but they would do this event there where they would have the different dorms and the fraternities would compete against each other in this competitive tug of war. And they would gather around this lake, and I had, as a kid, been involved in tug of war before, but it was always just sort of line up on two different sides and pull as hard as you can. But that's not what this was like. These guys practiced. They got together and they had tug of war strategy. Um, they had different, almost like members of the team that had different responsibilities. And they were led by, by a person, one of the, the students that they called their coach, whose his job was to be paying attention to where the other team was at and whether or not they needed to respond in a defensive status or if they were going to try to take the offense. He would look to see if there was a moment when they were kind of off guard, and if he could catch them in that moment, he would give out this call to his team, and that they would begin to pull, and they would do so in unison, and then he would have them rest, hold your ground, you dig in your heels, and you wait, you regain your strength, and you do it all again. And as I was remembering that moment, I thought, what an incredible picture of unity. As you and I, we think about all this kingdom language that is, is in the New Testament, and what Jesus describes about about who we are as the body of Christ, and, and Paul elaborates on that. And this notion of pulling in the same direction at the same time under the leadership and the guidance of our coach. This is what Paul is describing for us. This unity of, of the church is all grounded in spiritual oneness. The idea of being spiritually one. In fact, Paul says he has these seven different statements of, of what it means to be one. They're ultimately emphasizing our shared experience in the gospel, how they overcome our differences. We're created and founded in, in Christ. Look at what he says. He says, we are one body, a community of people gathered together because of Jesus, one spirit. We were sealed by the Holy Spirit. We came to Christ. We came to faith in Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So we share, as the church, a common origin. We have one hope. Though we were once hopeless apart from Christ, we have a common hope together in Christ. We have one Lord. This is our, our, our common profession as Christians, that we follow Jesus. That he is the Lord of our lives. And we do it together, collectively, as the church. We have one faith. One central belief, one creed at the center of which is the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. We have one gospel that we preach. We have one baptism. Each of us being united with Christ as Christians in his death, 
burial, and resurrection. And because we've been united with him in that, we are united with each other. We have one God and one Father who has brought us, adopted us as his sons and daughters, brought us into his shared family, which makes us brothers and sisters. And because of that, we have unity in him who is over all and through all and in all. See, Paul is emphatic here. He isn't attempting to pretend that we aren't different. He, in fact, when he talks about spiritual gifts, which just I'm going to almost entirely avoid here today, when he talks about the pro, I, I give some to be prophets and some to be apostles, we're going to dive into that after Easter when we talk about the Holy Spirit. We're actually going to spend, I think, two weeks talking about that. And so for our time here today, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of blush over that. Brush over that, not blush, right? Brush. Um, and, and yet, so Paul is recognizing, he's acknowledging diversity. And, and matter of fact, he, 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 he applauds it and celebrates it, but he's saying even in the midst of our diversity, even in the midst of how, how much we all bring something different to the table, there is this common unity. Because what he's explaining is that all the things that make us different, all, all the things that, that you and I would, would separate us, there's something greater that draws us together. What we've shared in Jesus is greater than everything that would separate or cause us to splinter or fragment. And he's saying this is what we need to understand. And I think, by the way, that and just a side note here, it is impossible, very difficult, I would say, to experience unity in, in the midst of isolation. This is why I think it's so important when, when Paul describes this whole idea here is that we experience this in the context of community together. The, whether it's corporate like this where we gather together and worship together and, and open up God's word together and, and serve together and, um, and everything that makes this up. Or it's in the context, of, you know, I know for me some of the greatest experiences of this have been sitting around a circle in my small group where I'm sharing life with people and sharing meal with people and they have opportunity to speak truth into my life and to challenge things and to, to celebrate when, when we are celebrating and to mourn when we are mourning. We're called to be in community together if we are going to be unified. And all of this then gives way to, to what Paul talks about as pursuing maturity. Pursue maturity. And again, I feel like there's a lot that we could talk about here, but I, I, I want to just highlight a couple things. This is back in verse 13 through 16. Paul's been talking about those gifts of shepherds and teachers and being building up the body of Christ, and he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Paul gives this incredible description of the church's unity in the midst of its diversity, and he says it's for, or its purpose, is to build the church's maturity. So the goal is that you and I would move beyond spiritual childhood to the point of, of spiritual maturity, that we would grow up in our faith, what verse 13 refers to as the fullness of Christ. So Paul is saying, Jesus is... And, and the life that he lived, what he modeled to us, that is the goal or the standard to which you and I have been called. Not, not that we would live perfectly, but these things that he talked about in verses 2 and 3, humility and gentleness and, and patience and love, those should be increasingly true of us if I am growing into maturity, into the fullness of Christ. Those should increasingly define me. Paul elaborates here on, on some of the the benefits are these insights into what this provides for us. And on the one hand, in verse 14, he says, this simply makes us less vulnerable. 
the spiritually mature, if we're, if we're growing in unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, become less susceptible to every new ideology or philosophy that permeates our culture. So think of it this way. If, 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 we are, if you've ever seen somebody who is charged or has the responsibility of identifying a forgery, they don't become experts by studying forgeries. They become an expert. They're able to identify what's wrong because they've studied what's true, what's original, what, what was the first thing. So this is what Paul is saying to us. He's saying, I want you to study, I want you to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done so that we aren't susceptible to, to every new ideology and every new philosophy that comes along if it doesn't line up with the character and purpose of Jesus. And I am confident that probably every pastor in the course of history has felt that the church at, at their time was perhaps particularly in need of discernment or in need of becoming experts in the teachings of Jesus. Otherwise, they, they risk becoming vulnerable. But again, I think that this feels, for me, particularly true for our season of history. In an age of sort of um, rampant individualism, where we're all sort of encouraged to develop and adopt a personal theology that works for us, my sense is that we are, as the church, extremely vulnerable when we buy into that idea. That, that in our vulnerability, we not only you lose our unity, but we'll ultimately lose our impact in the world if we aren't focused on who Jesus is and what he's teaching us. This is why the spiritual disciplines are so vital in our life. They're so important, and, and, and we could go on here for a while, but, but they're... they're uh, the tools, the means by which we have to come back to the standard, to the original, and to, and to look at other things and say, does this line up or doesn't it? Paul goes on to add that the spiritually mature will speak the truth in love. And again, I feel like there's a whole sermon here that I, I can't deliver this morning, but he says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into every way who, to him who is the head into Christ. I just simply want to point out that Paul is saying here that truth and love aren't at odds with each other. That, that one without the other is in fact counterproductive. It is an unloving thing to not speak truth. And truth that is not motivated by love will lose its power. You, you and I as the church have to be committed to both. And the spiritually mature Paul saying will be because it's necessary for us to grow up into, into every way, into him who is the head, into Christ. And then lastly, I, I think Paul in that last verse, he's saying this whole thing, it, it begins to reproduce itself. So the spiritually mature become involved, or they they're, they're become contributors. The idea, in Paul goes back to this metaphor, this body imagery that he's been using, and he's saying it's not enough for us to just grow into some point of knowledge or understanding or maturity in Christ it begins to reproduce itself. The, the more that we know, the more that we are able to then go back and those who are younger or who, who are new to the faith or less experienced, we begin to pour into those. I would say in an ideal situation, church, for us, every one of us should have somebody in our life who is farther along, more mature, growing in their faith, who is investing in us and teaching us what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we should have somebody on the flip side of that that we are doing that for them. I think that's what Paul is saying here when he talks about, in verse 16, each part of this body that he describes when working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, Paul says you're a part of this. If you're, if you're following Jesus, if you're committed to him, you are a part of this as the church. You have a job to do. And this is what it looks like. For us, when we're spiritually unified and we're, we're growing, we're becoming, we're understanding the fullness of Christ, this is, anything, this is what it looks like. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to gather again, to open up your word and to be encouraged and challenged. Paul has spent so much time reminding us and teaching us the story of the gospel and the love of Christ and what it's done for us. And now, as he begins to show us what it looks like to live that out, God, I pray that that we would be grounded and rooted in what it is that he's done for us so that we would be empowered and effective 
and living that out to the world around us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the ways that we experience, that we practice the unity within the body is in the opportunity to pray for each other. And you may have something going on in your life, something that you either want to celebrate and praise God for or something that's difficult and you would like support in. And you may not know me at all. Or you may not know uh, Andre and Heather or other people on our prayer team. But have confidence because what we share in common is far greater than, than us not knowing each other or what would separate us. There's some way that we can pray alongside of you this morning. The prayer team will be available. I'll be available. We'd love and be honored to do that. My heart, my prayer for us is the church, that we would be unified. And as we are unified, God would increase his, his effectiveness, the work that is happening in this community around us. We would become better as we grow in maturity in him. Now go in the name of Jesus Christ, by whom and through whom we are one. And may that oneness reflect to the world around us the glory of our God and their love. It's in his name we pray. Amen.